Hello there, uh, we're back again having a look at plants in the gardens at Abbotsbury. But it seems appropriate that we're at this spot because we talked about this beast last time. It was just coming out into flower. This is the Puya chilensis, which is now famous because it's been in the Times and it's been in the Telegraph. So, But what a beautiful flower. It's really quite unusual. Um, and each flower is full of nectar. And in the wild, you'll find hummingbirds coming in and drinking out the top of it. Uh, but as a bonus now, we found that the other plants just down the slope here are also flowering. And, uh, and they, to me, they have a, almost a prehistoric look. They're really quite, you know, gigantic in size and very unusual. So let's go and have a quick look at the other one. So this is another species. This is called Puya bertroniana. Um, very similar, similar habit, big spiky plants, backward facing barbs on the trunk here and from the dry arid zones of central Chile and the Andes. Whilst we're here on the Mediterranean bank, just point out this rather lovely Buddleia. Most people know Buddleia davidii, but this is Buddleia salvifolia and uh, it's a native to South Africa. But look at these leaves, it kind of tells you salvia, it looks like sage, the sort of the herb that you use for cooking. So hence, that's the Latin name of salvia, it's the same family. So it's just describing its sage-like foliage. But the flowers are really good for June as well. So we're walking down the Mediterranean bank here. Um, not the brightest of days, but we are getting some colour in here. A lot of the grevilleas here do very well on this bank, mostly because we're on iron ore, and the iron ore creates the acidity on this bank, which these plants in the Proteaceae family love. And in Australia, there's something like over 360 different uh, species of or forms of uh, grevillea. We've got a Good collection here, but we can't grow all of them because some of them are really tender. But this this is a lovely one, Rosemarina folia. And there's a lovely, um, slightly orangey one just coming into flower here. So this is Juniperus juniperina, oh, it's prickly, um, variety sulfurea. Quite a distinct form and shape. And what you'd expect to see on a Mediterranean bank, fantastic lavender. Uh, this is Lavendula stocas, subspecies pedunculata. It's one which grows in um, Portugal, Spain, France. They use it for the, the scents, the um, oils. Um, but these are getting more and more popular in the UK as the summers are getting drier and warmer. They seem to be thriving quite well as long as you've got good drainage with them. Uh, but they are lovely and I just love to touch. It's touchy, smelly and feely plant. Beautiful scent. So this time of year, as expected, to see echiums. Um, they do really well on the sort of coastal gardens in Britain, certainly in the south. They don't do very well inland, they will get frosted, but this is Echim pinaniana. Beautiful species here, you'll find it growing in the Canary Islands and Madeira. But look at that, you recognise the flower itself, it's like a bugloss. And here on the Chesil Beach we have our native Echium, which is only a small little plant growing a couple of feet tall, growing in the shingle. But this is a giant relative of it. So this is the, the really quite spectacular uh, Echium wild pretii. Beautiful colour on that red there is that tall one as well. Um, we grow these on a regular basis. Um, we keep collecting the seed, keep planting them out and they tend tend to, well they're almost biannual, so they'll grow for a year, flower on the second year, and then they'll usually die. Occasionally they'll stay a bit longer, 
So um, I say we keep recycling them and keep planting them out in, in warm, dry places and hope that the winters have been kind on them. If you get a real cold winter, they will die, but um, we've been pretty blessed with quite mild winters on the last few years and uh, good drainage is a secret as well. So this time of year, the garden is, uh, we have drifts of this beautiful Libertia grandiflora. It's the satin flower, it comes from New Zealand. Um, grandiflora itself means large flower, grandiflora, but it's um, a good, good sort of ground cover, it self seeds itself around. Very easy to propagate, you can sort of split and divide it. Um, being evergreen as well, it's quite useful, forming structure in the border. Um, but it's a bit haphazard in places, it does sell seeds, but we have some lovely avenues of it later on in the garden, further around the corner. But, so this time of year, it just brightens up the lower canopy of the under, under planting here. Well, this is a plant which is a, it looks like a giant cow parsley on steroids. But basically, that's what it is. They call it the black parsley. Um, it's a native to Madeira, high up in the um, Laura Silva forests, where it grows in the damp, humid cloud up there. And uh, we grow it here as a biannual, and it will take a year, or maybe two years, before it puts these amazing flowers out. But we just like the architectural shape, the, the beautiful structure of this plant and the flowers and the bees love it. Um, and so we'll grow quite a few around the garden. And, and look at that stem, it's all beautiful, kind of a very, almost like a, a palm tree like look to it. Growing here in this shallow stream is a plant that a lot of people will recognise. It's quite hardy. It's a or yellow monkey flower, they will call it. Um, Aranthi guttata, or it was called Mimulus at one time, then they changed the name. Um, but here it is naturalising and self seeding down following the stream as it should do in the wild. Um, and it comes from North America. Um, and it's actually found wild in places like Yellowstone Park, where it grows around the, the geysers and the waterways of the mountainous areas, um, and this part of California. But uh, it's now become naturalised in the UK. It's actually self-seeding in different rivers and moving around a bit. But it's an attractive plant. Bees like it, plants like it, um, uh, other insects like it. Um, but it's mostly annual, so this will die down, sell seed, and a lot more will come up next year. This is a, quite a rare Mahonia pallida from Mexico, flowering in the summer, June. So a lot of people grow Mahonias as a winter flowering plant, but this is a summer flowering one. Just coming out, the buds are just opening, but it's very dainty, smaller leafed, than some of the big Mahonias, but they're very attractive. This is another form of the, uh, the Chilean lantern tree, um, but it's a pink one. This is more unusual. It's called Crinodendron hookerianum ada Hoffman. And uh, it's probably not been in cultivation that long, uh, probably within the last 10 years or so, but. Um, most people associate you know, the red, pure red Chinese uh, Chilean lantern tree. But very pretty anyway. As we're looking at Chilean plants, there's another one here. This is a, a very rare plant called uh, Wymania, native to the forests of southern Chile. But look at the flowers on it. But flowing through, of course, this time of year is the deciduous azaleas all coming out and absolutely pack the scent. They really are beautiful scented plants. And uh, especially the yellow one, the mollies. So the gunner is just starting to grow now. The leaves will get even bigger by the end of the summer. 
three meters we measured one across, not so longer. Here's a plant a lot of people will be familiar with. Um, excuse the noise in the background, by the way. All the tractors are out there cutting grass. This is um, Viburnum opulus. What do you think the common name would be? Straight away you think, don't you? Snowball? It's called a snowball tree. So. Well, here we are in June, and this is one of the most spectacular crimson red rhododendrons, rhododendron matador, and um, flowering this time of year, June. So, you know, people often think rhododendrons are finishing by now, but there are late flowering cultivars coming out. So there's always some more interest, and this will probably go right through, through to the end of the month. This is one of the most spectacular uh, cornice flowering dogwoods, actually. It's a Cornus Venus, this one beautiful big uh, bracts there on the flower there. Um, but it makes a beautiful tree. This is going to start developing over the next few years and should fill this whole area up. But that's one of the biggest of all the Cornus flowers, flowering dogwood. Well, here we are in the bottom end of the valley here, in the Himalayan glade, quite appropriately with this fantastic tree, which is called Davidia, Davidia involucrata. Um, it's called the various common names, pocket handkerchief tree, the dove tree, because these amazing sort of feathery uh, white bracts that you see hanging down, they're not the true flower as such, but they do look like it could be birds hanging sitting in the tree. Um, but they are beautiful. But there's a lot of story about this tree because um, think of the name Davidia. It's named after a Jesuit priest, Pierre David or Pierre Armand David, a French priest who travelled into China in the early 1800s and he was trying to um, teach the Roman Catholicism to the locals. But he was also a passionate botanist, he was a passionate zoologist and he collected a lot of plants. And on his travels, he came across this rare tree in China and he sent a dried specimen back to Paris. And uh, it was a, a, quite a talked after tree, really, really unusual. Um, and some years later, there was um, a well-known Scottish botanist plant hunter, Augustine Henry. He went back out to China and he rediscovered this tree and he brought some seed back and sent it to Kew Gardens. And then uh, there was a big search on, because this was like the holy grail to get a hold of this plant. And at that time, nurserymen were really in a sort of a battle to get the best plants uh, to sell, because there were just new things arriving from plant hunters all over the world all the time. And um, so a nursery, nurseryman, um, the, the Vetch's nursery, so Harry Vetch, in, in, based in Exeter, he employed various botanists to go out and he employed Ernest Wilson to go off to China to find the seed of this rare plant because he really wanted to have it available to sell. Um, so Wilson arranged to go out and meet up with Augustine Henry because he knew the site where this tree was and they spent a lot of time traveling through pretty dangerous bandit country, a country where there were lots of disease rife and various malaria forms going around and they were being you know eaten by insects and they capsized in the river Yangtze once and uh, but eventually they found this village where he knew this tree was and to their horror the tree had been chopped down the day before for the locals to use the timber to make a building so that put scuppers to it so he carried on searching for another two years traveling around China in really remote areas but the Yangtze gorges into Sichuan province and eventually he found the plant and after a lot of uh, trouble he brought this seed back to UK and then the Vetch's nursery developed it and propagated it. And so you'll see it in a lot of parks and gardens around Europe now and in the States or anywhere, it's all around the world. 
but at one time in the 1800s it was a very rare plant to get hold of. A couple of other things about um, the priest Pierre Armand David. Uh, I said earlier he was a passionate zoologist interested in all sorts of nature and he came across in, in the royal emperor's palace a very very rare and unusual deer he'd never seen before and it was kept hidden away from the public in, in an enclosure um, and it was he, he did a lot of, lot of diplomatic uh, wangling to get hold from China um, a breeding pair of what later became called the Pier David deer and they managed to capture some and send them to uh, parks and gardens in Europe uh, and it was a, a very unusual deer. It's got a kind of long tail, quite different, distinctly looked uh, to any other deer. Um, but they found the breeding program wasn't very successful and, and they were finding out that not long after he'd got these deer, there was a thing called the Boxer Rebellion in China. And uh, this, the, the palace grounds of the Royal Emperor's house was ransacked. The deer that he had were all killed and eaten for food because uh, everybody was starving. So they ended up with the only deer left in the world almost back in Europe. So it was a manic program to start breeding them because um, it's a big conservation thing even in those days. And uh, so they, they rounded several pairs up from Europe and took them to Woburn Abbey, uh, the Duke of Bedfordshire's home where they are now you know, still there and uh, roaming free in this beautiful park and they use them as a breeding stock for other parks around Britain. And in fact, the owners of Abbotsbury Gardens, they have a home at Melbury House where they have Pierre David roaming in their deer park with red deer, fallow deer, and whatever. So it, it's a, a long story, but it all kind of came from Pierre David. One other thing about Pierre David also, Everybody knows the butterfly bush. You'll see it as a weed going along the railway lines. It's all over the place. But lovely flowers in the summer, different forms, different textures and colours of it. But that's called um, Budlia davidii, named after Pierre David. So we're, we're just coming into the, what we call the, the jungle ride. And we've got a lot of foliage plants, big leaf plants, creating that sort of nice exotic look. Um, there's banana leaves just starting to open up. But here on the ground, this is a quite a lovely plant, Peltophyllum, and it's native to China. This particular form with this lovely moth, mottled marking, they call it Spotty Dotty. Um, but I like this, grows in the shade, doesn't seem to be affected by slugs or snails like hostas do. Um, takes a while to establish, but once it's here, it's a really impressive, very jungly looking plant. But what people don't realise, it does flower, but the flowers are, are right down here. And it's only just starting to perform now. You can see there's, there's almost like a chocolatey red flower which hangs down underneath the leaves. But a spectacular plant for um, any garden really, especially woodland gardens. This is a, a rather nice butylon vitifolium and um, look at the height of it, way up there. And I remember when um, travelling around Chile with some friends, we uh, saw this growing in the wild, just naturally coming up through the shrubs on the side of the road when you're driving along and it used to catch your eye, along with that with the chronodendrons, the Chilean lantern trees, which there happens to be one there as well. So. But the, it's, it's doing very well, it's, it's kind of supported in, in amongst this big uh, cordyline tree. The fine drift of Mechanopsis, the poppies here. We call them, call them Welsh poppy. I'm not quite sure why, perhaps they indigenous to Wales, you never know. But they do make a nice display through. Right, well, so ending our tour back in the Victorian garden here. Um, there's still a lot of colour. The early spring stuff's finished, the camellias have gone over. I say late rhododendrons coming out. We've got alliums appearing. We've got the insetis, the red bananas down there with the alliums. And in our central focus bit, we've got a lot of um, aeoniums, big fleshy plants here. They're all native to the Canary Islands and Madeira. Um, but they do make a great display in the summer and they come out from the glass houses and we'll put them here. They're much more sort of architectural than ordinary summer bedding. 
but um, and they don't take a lot of water, which is great in this coming day and age with dry, drought appearing in the summer. They virtually look after themselves throughout the throughout the summer period, and we'll probably lift them, take them back under glass probably early November. So it's quite a long season outside. So I hope that's given you a nice flavour of the gardens in early to midsummer. Well, no, I wouldn't say midsummer yet, is it? It's early summer. We've got lots more to come yet. So uh, we'll do another video clip when we get a chance in uh, another month or two and see how the garden's changed. See you again.